we've been looking at Mexican muralism and focused on Mexican history all semester. And now we're going to focus on Cuba and Cuba and Cuban history, at least a little sliver of it, the more recent um, recent era of Cuban history after the revolution. Again, just a quick sort of um, quick overview of all of it. And I think it's an important addition to what we've been doing, because as you've noticed, we've been in sort of a time loop looping in the early part of the 20th century from around the time of the Mexican Revolution all the way up until, I'd say, World War II, which is when we get Siqueiros. And I'd say that's the last hurrah of the Mexican muralist movement in terms of their kind of relevance to the Mexican Revolution, which you know quickly fades into history by the mid-1900s, since it was in 1911. And of course, um, uh, their relevance for the United States, because of course the Mexican muralists don't return to the United States after World War II. And the focus really shifts away from uh, Mexico to places like Cuba. Now remember, Mexico contributed over half of the United States raw materials for World War II used to defeat beat Hitler um, and win the war against fascism. So that's quite an alarming, or not alarming, quite a jaw-dropping number to over a half of all the raw materials. So that goes a long way in helping you understand the goal of the United States with the inviting, with inviting like the likes of Diego Rivera, Orozco, and Siqueiros to the United States. There's an agenda. I'm sure there are also people who also really supported them artistically and all that, but underlying it, paying for it all, were people like the Rockefellers and others who saw the pragmatism of mending fences with Mexico because they were planning on going to war with Hitler. And as you know, we, as I just told you, we took a lot of raw, raw materials, bought a lot of raw materials from Mexico. I'm assuming we did that so that we didn't use our own raw materials that we probably store those in a way or leave those untapped as a kind of security um, measure, which, you know, you can get into the whether or not that's cool or not. But certainly Mexico contributed um, an undeniably important amount of help for World War II. Now that shifts after World War II because, of course, World War II is over and we enter into the period called the Cold War. So now we really break free of that loop that we've been going through the loop with, you know, Diego Rivera, Frida Kahlo, Siqueiros, Orozco, and we see the Great Depression, you know, Russian Revolution, and we saw, um, of course, that leads up into the Cold War and World War II and then the Cold War. And the Cold War is just that, it's a war that's cold, <laughs> which is to say it's not, um, there's no, uh, what would you call it? Like, uh, there's no world war. There's no open war. It's more of like a um, a war operated by play groups like the CIA or intelligence agencies or proxy wars with smaller countries. And it's certainly a kind of feeding frenzy on the scraps of the British Empire, the former British Empire, which now after World War II is kind of dismantled and places like India and places in Africa and Asia especially become newly independent. And with that newly independence comes this question of destiny. Will they become capitalist or will they become communist? And that right there is the heart of the Cold War. This The destiny of the world after Hitler's gone is sort of a, a, a race between the United States and the Soviet Union for the hearts and minds of people around the world. And sadly, uh, at least maybe from our point of view, sadly, Cuba becomes a kind of a pawn in this chessboard between the United States and um Russia, Soviet Union. And I think Fidel Castro benefited the most from this being a sort of man of history, someone who recognizes his role in history. Um, and maybe the Cuban people are the ones who least benefited from that, at least in more in terms of recent history. I think there's no doubt, and we'll see today, that uh, the Cuban Revolution, just like the Mexican Revolution, achieved some wonderful things, especially for the lowest rungs of society. Um, however, one contrast with the Mexican Revolution is the Cuban Revolution doesn't necessarily have the same promise for for solidifying and cementing those um, those those improvements, those reforms into permanence. So it's a real there's a real question mark hanging over Cuba right now, um, especially because it's in really economic 
um, this a lot of economic despair right now, which means a lot of those benefits and improvements from the revolution that happened about 50 years ago are now on the steep decline, food shortages, power shortages, tourism has dropped. So we'll learn about that next week and these contemporary artists who I think are really the, the, the best examples of people continuing the torch, carrying the torch of revolution and art um, into the 21st century. And today we'll look more at the kind of uh, what the Cuban revolution means, how art plays into the revolution. And of course, what makes Cuba distinct from the United States, I mean, from uh, Mexico. And one of the most important things, of course, is slavery. Um, the important contributions of African, Afro-Cuban culture to Cuba, something we don't necessarily see so widespread in Mexico because you don't have as many crops like sugar that requires so much heavy labor. So although, although there are some exceptions like in Belize and the coastal parts of Mexico, as a whole, you don't have as much of a an African population in Mexico like you do in the United States or in a place like Brazil. So that's one first big difference uh, between Mexico and Cuba is the important uh, importance of the African population. And the best parallel to that might be the indigenous population, of course, in Mexico. So you could say those are um, maybe the opposite sides of the same coin, a huge marginal, marginalized group um, that's sort of been um, exploited and taken advantage of and marginalized by history. And needs a revolution in order to gain some kind of cultural or even legal legitimacy, political legitimacy. And that um, we'll see when we get to, um, of course, when we talk about the revolution. And one other big difference is Mexico wasn't annexed by the United States. Um, and that's quite a remarkable difference, of course. Um, and we'll start with that in a moment. And then, of course, the communist revolution in Cuba. Cuba becomes a communist country after the revolution. And that definitely sets it on a different course away from the United States, which is unlike what we saw with Mexico and Mexico's prohibition of the Communist Party in 1926 or thereabouts. So those are some of the big themes to think about. Um, and when we look at Cuban art, the big question will be, and we'll tackle this a little bit towards the end today, and a lot tomorrow, or a lot, sorry, not tomorrow, but next week. And that will be this idea of, well, how does Cuban art um, reflect the goals and aspirations of the Cuban revolution? And is it just like the the goal of the Mexican muralist to celebrate the revolution? And you know, where does where is that boundary perhaps between politics and creativity? And of course, in a country where communism is paying for your education, that boundary between the blurry, the boundary between your own sort of autonomy and your duty to country become blurred. And I think more so than what we saw in Mexico. Um, and again, I think that's mainly because Mexico never embraces communism. And so you don't have that sort of super centralized state government. If anything, in Mexico, you have what you have in a lot of Latin America, which is a weak, a very weak central government and provinces with more autonomy. And that's a mirror image of what you see with the cartels. The cartel is a great, a great example in Mexico of, of more state or local power that, um, that challenges the central government, which is weak. So this picture, I think, says a lot about what we just talked about. Um, you might recognize the figure on the left is like the equivalent of the Statue of Liberty or Technically, she's known as Columbia, which is the spirit of the new world um, in the name of Columbus. And this is a picture coming in the wake of the U.S. the U.S. Spain war. So we go to war with Spain over basically over dominance of the Western Hemisphere. Spain continues to have colonies in uh, the Western Hemisphere, even after all the other countries revolt. Remember, Mexico revolted and became independent. Well, Cuba doesn't become independent until 1898. And that's because Cuba is able to maintain itself under Spanish rule because Spain has a big navy. And having a big navy means it's, means it's easy to blockade a country and to maintain your authority over that place. So Cuba being an island is, is such an important part of its identity. And in 1898, 1898, we go to war with Spain, and some people would say this is sort of an inevitable conflict over domination of the Western Hemisphere. Comes straight out of the idea of the Monroe Doctrine or the Roosevelt Corollary, which basically gives us free reign 
to interfere in other countries and even invade them, which of course is um, a real violation of sovereignty. And Cuba's maintain Cuba's quest for sovereignty, uh, is, which is to say uh, autonomy, uh, independence, uh, in the face of other countries that want to take control of it, has been this sort of long history of Cuba. And even today, the ir irony is now the first time ever Cuba is is not dependent on any other countries. And it's also um, suffering, reeling from that more than ever. So um, we will eventually get to that next class when we look at the more contemporary world of Cuba. But for now, we'll look at this era from uh, Cuban sort of independence thwarted because the United States takes control over Cuba after its independence um, and then leading all the way up to uh, the 1970s and 1980s. So this is probably Cuba uh, like a child depicted as a child taking its first toddler steps towards its own independence. But as anyone in Cuba would say, you know, the the Cuban independence was not was was only in in on paper, not in in fact, because the United States basically continues to um, dominate Cuba culturally, politically. And this is one of the big reasons why Cuba has its, its revolution, because eventually the United States owns most of the land and has total control over Cuba. So the Cuban revolution is, is in a way a kind of act of independence from the United States and also a reckoning with its many uh, decades, if not centuries of uh, marginalizing slaves and um, uh, having poverty um, be the rule rather than the exception. This is a painting by a famous artist who is a famous from a famous family, and it shows you the death of one of the leaders of the Cuban independence movement. But I think you could also see this as symbolic symbolic of Cuba itself almost being sacrificed uh, or sacrificing for its independence, um, a kind of this martyr like symbol. Um, and I think you could also see you know you should see that as a reflection of of Cuba's kind of independence being taken over by the United States. And of course, the big question is how does Mexican muralism influence Cuba? Why isn't there, is there um, a revolutionary spirit in Cuba leading up to or in response to the Mexican revolution? And that's one of the primary things we're gonna look at now. Um, you know, this landscape of Cuba, very typical of what you might see in Cuba, you know, there's there's a feeling of kind of almost Id idyllic paradise. There's no sense of, um, change or disruption but of course that will come from mexico and that will have a, a big influence on a lot of the world um you could say that this is the first domino that falls in the 20th century leading to other dominoes like the russian revolution the cuban revolution and other places so this is a great example of uh i think well you tell me who Whose influence, this is, a, I think, clearly shows you the influence. Well, I guess you can read it on the left. You can see the influence of Diego Rivera here. So this is an early example of Cuban artists trying to channel some of that visual, that revolutionary energy into Cuba. Now, the difference, again, is, of course, in Cuba, there isn't a revolution until 1959. So these are kind of revolutionary inspire aspiring pictures without the revolution. And you could also say, well, there's also a different uh, set of concerns in Cuba. It's over dependence on, on sugar and slavery. And slavery doesn't end in Cuba until 1886. And when the United States takes over Cuba, we continue, you know, we almost, we, remember we still have segregation well into the 1950s, if not the 60s. And so because we're, we've are we basically annexed Cuba, our kind of segregation policies are kind of the blueprint for Cuba. And so as a result, Cuba continues to be a very kind of segregated society. Um, as you might expect, places where there's a larger African population correspond to places where there's sugar. And especially in the Eastern parts of the island, that's where you see the most um, historical examples of, of fomenting revolution, partly because that's where the sugar was, but also that's farthest away from the center of power in Havana. So this is probably one of the, you know, we'll see a few examples. This is, I think, Diego Rivera's influence. And it's not just the figures, I think it's also the, the sense of community, the collective. And it does kind of foreshadow Cuba's shift to kind of communism, perhaps. Here is maybe the equivalent of a Porfirio Diaz, 
a dictator in Cuba, and he's someone who is very much in the pocket of the United States and stifles any uh, dissent, throws people in prison. And so you don't really have these, the call to action that you have in Mexico to visualize the revolution. If anything, it's almost like this, this um, maybe facsimile, a, 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 a copy without that, without the revolution driving it. So, you know, I think you could look at these two pictures and say, yeah, that they do look like it's the same subject, someone going into the countryside to educate children. But the big difference is, as we learned with Mexico, those people in the back are guarding the the everyone so that they can learn and educate and and become literate in, in safety. Whereas on the left, the guy on the horse is just that, a guy going by on a horse. There's really none of that, no sense of kind of antagonism or conflict. And I guess you could say that's a good thing, but of course the prop problem is um, this picture on the left is more aspirational. This isn't really what's going on in Cuba. There's no state support for people going out and educating people in the countryside. So if anything, this artist is just trying to aspire to kind of maybe visualize what you something you could do in a Cuba, um, but that, without this really being a reality in Cuba. Stuff like this will happen after the Cuban Revolution. And that's a big, one of the big uh, achievements of the revolution is educating most of the Cuban people. But sadly, this would wait another 30 years. So you can already feel that the winds of change from Mexico are blowing into Cuba, but it's as if there's like already a windscreen there because of the involvement of the United States and also um, the lack of revolution, the lack of real political change because of that status quo. And I think this picture here by a Cuban artist shows you that status quo. So what do you think? It does look almost like a Diego Rivera painter here. This, you know, the more, yeah, after looking at Mexico, the Mexican muralist, you can almost see some hints of, of a few of them, maybe even Orozco. What do you guys think? What, do, what are we looking at here? Um, or, and or, you know, do you feel any of the influence of the Mexican muralists? What do you think is actually going on in the picture um, in the background? Someone said, uh, yeah, and so that I think shows you that the centrality of that uh, uh, that the plantation work in this case sugar is uh, really fitting um, fitting because that is such an important part of Cuba's history this dependence on sugar and if you don't diversify your economy many countries suffer from not diversifying and it's kind of like if you don't have I don't know maybe it's not, maybe not the best equivalent of like having you know several jobs. Uh, but it's the same kind of uh, maybe s security that you get having diver a diversified economy means if the sugar prices plummet, you won't um, plunge into poverty. So Cuba's ongoing dependency on sugar, I think, is part of the status quo here that we see. And dependence on sugar means dependence on cheap labor, which means even if slavery is ended, just like in the United States, that doesn't mean that Jim Crow is over. Because after slavery was ended in the United States, you still have a largely uneducated, um, oh, exploited group of Blacks, um, African Americans in the United States who, um, you know, continue to be exploited, um, you know, especially into, you know, it's well into the 1960s, if not even today. And now I think today immigrated immigrants, undocumented, undocumented immigrants would have, would be the sort of substitute um, cheap source of labor. So this is a this that shows an important part of the status quo, the sugar, and it's an unreliable um, employment. It's only certain parts of the year, so it's not year round. So it's a real nightmare to become dependent on one crop, and on top of that, sugar. Um, and you know, so there's something you know pathetic about sugar because it's it's something sweet without substance, and. So there's something almost symbolic about its lack of 
real value. Um, and of course, around them, you see, I guess, the merchants of, of industry. Um, these are probably soldiers protecting um, you know, sugar above all else. And these are Cubans looking on kind of in disbelief as their country is sort of divided up and, and cut up into pieces. And of course, you got the bankers up there or someone trading and the United States gunships are probably what you see on the upper left. So it's a really a picture about the status quo. But I think you could also feel the Diego Rivera influence here, um, you know, tackling history, tackling uh, um, politics, using a picture to summarize a situation in a country and definitely kind of a call to change in Cuba. You can see them processing the sugar into um, something we're capable of exporting. And the closest you get to muralism is something like this. I think this is probably one of the better examples of muralism in Cuba. I don't have a version in color. Um, it looks like it was destroyed. And this is artists in Cuba trying to replicate what's going on in Mexico with the best, doing the best they can without knowledge of how to make frescoes. Like literally what this guy, Carlos Enriquez, uh, call, is on the phone, I think at some point, I can't remember how they contact each other to learn the, the, the recipe for making fresco. Now, remember when we learned about murals, it's um, um, the importance of location is important both for visibility, maybe for um, the numbers of people, you know, the, 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 pop, the, the density of people, but also the location in terms of the climate. Mexico has a much more, shall we say, forgiving climate at least in Mexico City and other parts, much more temperate, whereas Cuba is very tropical. And if, as you know from living in Florida, if you've been here in the summer, it rains and when it rains, it pours. And it, when it rains and pours, it's because it's really hot out and all that water is evaporating and coalescing into clouds. So the combination of heat, humidity, and water means that I don't think a mural in Cuba is gonna last more than one year, literally one year outside just because of the heat damage, the water damage. So that's one reason why I think Mexican muralism doesn't necessarily become the medium, the vid form of visualizing change um, or a big major part of Cuban culture like it is in Mexico. Another reason is because, and I think this is a more important reason, because you don't have the state support for Mexican muralism or state support for muralism in Cuba that we saw in Mexico. This, nevertheless, though, is a really wonderful example of muralism. I think unlike anything we saw in Mexico, so much movement, it, but you can still recognize the figures as being like campesinos on horseback. Um, and it seems to be a real call to like change and kind of emulating perhaps a Zapata, the idea of you know getting on horse, the cowboy revolutionary. Maybe in, in Mexico, you would have more indigenous population and in Cuba, it might be the Mambises, those are kind of the Afro-Cuban revolutionaries, or of course, just, you know, Campesino Guajiro is the name of Campesino in Cuba. And yeah, sadly, this mural was destroyed. Um, so this would not be something that it, it might, you know, be, you might be able to locate a fragment of it, fragment of this mural. Um, but likewise here, there's so you few other examples here where they're really channeling that call to action, call to arms, here using the image of Jose Marti, who is a leader of the independence movement. If you take my Cuban class, you'll learn about him. And he's a major figure throughout Latin America. He's kind of like a Che Guevara without the violence, without the commitment to violence. Um, now, not to say that Jose Marti wasn't committed to um, overthrowing Spain and independence, uh, but we'll, as we'll learn with, with uh, Che Guevara, he was someone who, for instance, you know, assassinated his political opponents and was much more of a kind of someone who rea was reacting to having first first hand it first hand having first hand witnessed um the United States involvement in places like Mexico and or especially Guatemala and I think that very much sets him on a path of violence resistance against the United States and um imperialism so yeah here you can see Peria I guess it was Peria who's wants to learn the dry fresco technique. And so sadly, one of the big differences is Cuba doesn't have, you know, the artists like Diego Rivera who spent time in Europe 
or uh, uh, C.K. Eidos, who spent time in Europe. We will see an artist named Wilfredo Lamb who did spend time in Europe, but not to learn the fresco technique. So, you know, these artists are kind of like a crew without a boat. They want to learn. They want to use fresco. They want to emulate Mexico, but they don't have either the state support or the knowledge and or the environment, the right climate for mess for mural making. So one exception, of course, is Siqueiros, as we saw, he comes to Cuba. And I think I mentioned that the reason why he comes to Cuba is he wants to gain favor with the United States. He wants to be able to come to the United States to get a visa, but that doesn't succeed. So the best, the closest he gets is, of course, here making a homage, a tribute to Lincoln and Marti, which is a wonderful thing to do in Cuba because of the history of slavery in Cuba. Lincoln is very much associated with ending slavery and Marti is one of his main calls is, um, you know, ending slavery in Cuba and the, you know, the getting rid of the cleansing, the stain of slavery. So those are certainly two people who belong together for that theme. And, you know, these examples, I'm not sure if these still survive in Cuba. Uh, when I go back to Cuba, I will, of course, be looking for them. And sadly, these don't leave a legacy, um, much of a legacy behind. You, you can't really say that Siqueiros has a successor. Um, and again, that's because I think, especially by the 1940s, um, there's no state support for muralism. And even by the 1940s in the United States, as you know, we shift away from muralism to abstract art partly because we don't want, and when I say we, people like Rockefellers and the government don't want muralism to stoke the fires of communism and revolt against capitalism. So there's all these forces moving against muralism by the 1940s. And so you don't have support for that in the United States, and you certainly don't have the state support for muralism in Cuba. And if I remember, Siqueiros was able to pay for his way by making a mural here in the Hotel Sevilla in, in Old Havana, which I have to go visit and look for. I doubt it's still there because I think I would have found it, but that'll be another thing I look for. I'll make a, when I go to Cuba, I'll, after I go, I'll send you guys all a little map of places where you can go visit to see mosaics, or, I mean, uh, murals, if I find any. So I'll give you a little pilgrimage route. Um, but I think he continues his, uh, well, as we saw, he continues his mural making when he go back, goes back to Mexico. But sadly, it doesn't, leave a mark in Cuba. The best example of mural making, I think, from this period, the mid-1900s, comes from Amelia Pelayas, whose work is definitely recognizably Cuban. And that will become a very interesting theme when it comes to Cuban art, looking at Cuban art. Um, I think you guys would agree that it's pretty easy to recognize Mexican art versus maybe art from the United States, especially if you're looking at like Rita Kahlo or Diego Rivera, wherever there's a lot of indigenous influence or presence. Whereas it might be trickier to recognize what to make, well, what is recognizably Cuban art? And that question becomes an important question when we get closer to the contemporary era. Like what does it, do you need to look like your, your, you know, art, does your art need to look like it's from your country? And I don't think we'd ever say uh, someone from the United States, their art needs to look like it's from the United States. But if you're a tourist visiting the United States, maybe you might be looking for an example of art that reflects the United States somehow. So that's always an interesting question. And I think Amelia Palaez fits or navigates this question very interestingly because her work does look very Cuban because if you ever go to Cuba, you will see all kinds of what's called reja forjada, the forged ironwork. And her work is definitely inspired from that kind of very ubiquitous, very present, visible part of Cuban um, kind of architecture and the human landscape. So she's kind of abstracting day-to-day -day elements from Cuban society. And you can see here down below her mural uh, adorns the facade of the Havana Libre. Now the Havana Libre used to be the Havana Hilton. After the Cuban Revolution, it was transformed into the Havana Libre because that is a sort of statement against the United States, uh, having ousted the United States now. It's a liberated Havana Hilton. Now it's the Havana Libre. And on the front, you can see this mural down below. By the way, that's um, that's the Caribbean or the Gulf. Um, Florida would be somewhere off in the distance beyond the horizon. So we're here in um, you know downtown Havana. And the Malecon or the waterfront plays a really important um, role culturally, geographically in the city, as we'll see later 
so what do you think? Does this look at all like the Mexican mural, any of the Mexican murals that we've seen? I'll show you a few pictures of it. It's nice that the water, I gotta say, it's a nice aquatic. It feels very like it flows right out of the building's color pattern. Um, but you know, this question we had when we looked at muralism is, you know, abstract, should should, should, it, should it be, as, as Siqueiro said in his manifesto, art should be kind of intelligible, um, you know, something that, that resonates with the public at large. And I think, well, this passes that question of, it's recognizably Cuban, and I think on that level, it's a celebration of Cuba. Um, but would would you say this is revolutionary? Would you say that this mural looks like any of the Mexican muralists we've seen? Um, yeah, I, I agree. It's more abstract and contemporary feeling. So you know, it's, and I think you could say, well, that's nice that they don't feel like they have to, you know, be constrained by you know politics. It doesn't have to, you know, especially if you're in a hotel. I don't think a hotel is necessarily you know a place for tourism. You might not necessarily put a Diego Rivera on the front of a hotel, right? It may be more fitting for the lobby of Rockefeller Center. So there's that. Um, and you might also just think, well, Cuban art should look different than Mexican art. So, um, but the question, of course, is what about revolution? What about that question of, you know, using art to um, put the mar re restore the marginal to the center or using art to promote social change or revolution? I don't think this passes that bar. There's, I don't think you could say this is, you know, Orozco or Rivera or Siqueiros. I think all of them would have rejected this because they see the mural as something that's meant to address social issues and or nationalism and or um, restoring the indigenous culture to its rightful place. Um, and of course, that's just one specific reality for Mexico. But I think you can agree that it doesn't really bleed over into Cuba. And again, I think that's because the, the forces commissioning this mural are not looking for revolution. They're looking to kind of to gratify the tourist coming to Cuba and or celebrate Cuban culture without, um, you know, maybe biting the hand that feeds it. Never, nevertheless, a beautiful mural. Uh, a wonderful example of muralism in Havana, and probably a lot easier to restore something like this, um, you know, to paint over abstract areas when it, you know, decays because of um, rainfall. Um, you can even see the weathering on this here. So, you know, a lot of Cuba is falling apart, and that includes artwork in public on the walls of the streets. And as we'll see next class, the artists working today in Havana they're painting on top of decaying walls and it's a lot easier to paint on walls that are decaying because there's already, you know, a bunch of broken windows, proverbial broken windows, or, you know, that's why graffiti pops up in cities, usually where there's, you know, industrial overlooked parts of the city that are just sort of begging for love and attention. So it's a similar case with Cuba that the contemporary artists we'll see next week are thriving, um, in an environment where it's much more open because everything is in such a state of neglect and disrepair. The exceptions, of course, are tourist locations, but tourism has plummeted in Cuba because of the pandemic. Um, so yeah, Cuba is really reeling right now. Um, and I, if you do want to travel to Cuba, I would just say, be, you know, remember it's very different than the United States as far as the internet isn't as reliable. It is very safe with the exception of you might get scammed or pickpocketed, but you won't have the same risk of violence that you have in Mexico. Um, and also I think it's probably more expensive in, in Cuba perhaps than in Mexico. Um, but also Cuba today is reeling from blackouts and food shortages. So I don't wanna to get too far ahead of ourselves. The closest example of cross pollination uh, is with Fredo Lamb. It was a really interesting case because his artwork really is uh, important because it stands astride both important historical realities of the 20th century, like Hitler's invasion of Paris, but also because he returned to Cuba prior to the revolution. And in a way, he's almost kind of out of step, out of, synchronic, out of synch synchronization with uh, kind of the political realities. Um, and you'll see how that plays out with his career now. So his artwork you can see is on easels. And of course, that's very different than painting a mural. And he very much is uh, is influenced by his close relationship to uh, Pablo Picasso. Now, Wilfredo Lamb grew up in Cuba, 
and very much, very much exposed to Afro-Cuban culture, especially the Santeria and Afro-Cuban religions, which are kind of a blend, a hybrid of Catholicism and Afro-Cuban religions. Remember, unlike the indigenous populations who, you know, as, as persecuted as they were, at least they in, in Mexico, they were still in their home country, whereas African slaves were forcibly relocated from Africa. And if you think about what kind of cultural retention you have, well, anything you bring with you, in your, inside of you, your beliefs, you can preserve that, but that's it. And so you can understand how important religion is, if that's really the only vestige, only trace you have of your connection to your own, your home world is what you can carry on the inside of you. And that's, you know, that's really just such a powerful, um, if, if not kind of tragic reality facing slaves in Cuba. On top of that, you know, Cuba's an island, so it's not like you can walk back to Africa and many Cuban escaped slaves, which are called Cimarrones, they would settle in the eastern part of Cuba. And that became kind of a very, um, a, a place with a lot of density of, of escaped slaves. So with Fredo Lam is someone who kind of escapes Cuba. And I think he escapes Cuba willfully because he doesn't initially see a future in Cuba, mainly because of his Afro-Chinese heritage. His father is a Chinese immigrant. His mother is a former slave. And his childhood is marked by exposure to his uh, godmother and her um, and her religious practices. And those become very much a source of inspiration, if not a central part of his artwork after he goes to France. And it's none other than Picasso who kind of affirms uh, with Fredo's identity, his Afro-Cuban identity, I think partly because Pablo Picasso feels inadequate, and we'll see why that is. Whereas with Fredo Lamb, as according to Picasso, is a, an authentic voice of the marginal people. Whereas Pablo Picasso, and I think we could, you know, understandably agree with that, is not necessarily like the the rightful voice on behalf of the African oppressed people in Africa, especially because at the time. Countries like France had already carved up Africa, and it continues today with Africa really being, um, especially under French rule, a really kind of an oppressed um, continent. And, you know, between England, Germany, France, and other countries, the 1800s, they carved up Africa. And as a result, um, you know, Africa's culture is really kind of colonized and places like the British Museum are just filled with artifacts stolen from Africa. You know, and that's true all around the world. You know, we talked about in Mexico with artifacts, you know, from indigenous culture being erased or burned or destroyed. So with Fredo Lam goes to Spain, he is sort of someone who is, is, is dogged by history because the Spanish Civil War breaks out. This is a famous painting, uh, photograph by Robert Capa, if I recall, from the Spanish Civil War. And with Fredo Lam flees to Paris where he meets Pablo Picasso. And this is Pablo Picasso's heyday when he's, you know, really pushing abstract art to, you know, the point of what you see here. And, you know, as we, we've looked at a lot of muralism, but none of the muralism we've looked at um, has this really commitment to abstraction. And I think in a way, Picasso does what Diego Rivera wanted to do, but never did because maybe he understood that perhaps abstraction was too far removed from you know resonating with the average Mexican. But I think that's too bad because it looks like Pablo Picasso achieved what Diego Rivera wanted to do, which is um, you know use cubism to inform his mural making. And I think, I don't know, if have, has any of you ever seen Guernica in person? Have any of you ever actually seen it? I think it's either, it was in New York, in New York for a while. I think it's now at the Reina Sofia in Madrid. Um, have any of you guys been to Madrid? I highly recommend going to Spain. It's my favorite country in the world. Go there before you go to Cuba or Mexico if you can. But if you go to the Reina Sofia, you'll see Guernica. Now, how big do you think this painting is? Just what do you think, just based on what you see? Give me a give me a guess. I know it's impossible to know without actually seeing it. What do you think? How big is Guernica? Right, we got a guess. We say someone says pretty big. Yeah, twenty feet. Yeah, I think twenty feet. It might be actually uh, smaller. Yeah, I think it's more like 50, but I think that's a little, I can't remember exactly. I, this is something I probably should know because it's such an important painting. 
um, it's enormous. It is absolutely enormous. Um, it's like jaw droppingly big, like Mexican muralism big and Diego Rivera big. <laughs> so I want, I would love to know what Diego Rivera thought about this, about Guernica. Uh, and it's such a cool example of art having now looked at Mexican muralism because you can kind of see Picasso addressing what's going on in Europe. This is a painting about the destruction of a rural town in Northern Spain called Guernica by the fascist forces of Franco, who is trying to defeat the Republicans, uh, the ones who favor the Republic in Spain. And it's a painting about the violence of war, industrial warfare, destroying all the animals and people, like collateral damage in the middle of the night, woken up by a bomb blast, which you know obliterates the farmhouse. And it's a really important picture about war and the nature of war, the violence, and using painting to address that is such a, you know, as much as I dislike Picasso in a lot of ways, even his, a lot of his paintings I'm not a big fan of, this one's amazing. And it's such a powerful visual statement and it's using abstract language so effectively. And, you know, I, I can imagine Diego Rivera looking at this, looking at this and just shaking his head and realizing, wow, P Picasso, Picasso actually did it. <laughs> Whereas Diego Rivera never really gave himself permission to, to kind of, continue to explore abstract art um and you know he did other things which is gr great too i'm sure picasso was floored by what diego rivera did i sure hope so i personally like diego rivera's work a little more than picasso but it's so neat to kind of look at this work as an example of kind of large-scale painting muralist in scope um from picasso in the what 1930s and certainly the same time period we're talking about with uh, the mexican muralist coming to the united states so this is definitely kind of something I'm sure they heard about and a very important statement against fascism. Picasso ends up having to get ex exiled. The painting itself is exiled. Even before uh, the United States invaded Iraq, this painting or a copy of it was on display at the United Nations. And before Colin Powell address the United Nations urging the war to support the world to support the United States invasion of Iraq, which was wrong on every level. They covered up the painting Guernica. They covered it up so it wouldn't remind people about this message of you know peace and, and being anti-war. So this is probably one of the most important paintings of the 20th century, and rightly so. And with Fredo Lam is best friends with Pablo Picasso. And you can see the output with Fredo Lam. Uh, is incredibly prolific at this time. And yet he's still, I think, kind of trying to be relevant in more of a European sense and just hasn't quite reached the point where he's kind of honoring his Cuban roots, where he's fertilizing his, allowing his, his Cuban roots to fertilize and blossom into um, something, you know, distinctly Cuban. Now, remember, his plan wasn't necessarily to return to Cuba initially. Initially, he thought, there's no future for me in Cuba. But when he meets Pablo Picasso, Pablo Picasso really, and and if you if you had Wilfredo Lam in the room, he would say Pablo Picasso was probably the most important positive influence in his life. So even though I'm going to be a little critical of Pablo Picasso, it's more of a, a hate the sin, love the sinner kind of situation. And I think likewise with Wilfredo Lam, he would have said, yes, Europe has 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 kind of colonized Africa and and stolen all of its patrimony. But nevertheless, there's an you know, important reckoning with all that. And Pablo Picasso is a force that's trying to kind of, you know, to, to fix the record so to a degree. And Pablo Picasso tells with Fredo Lam, where one is born, one is made. And this quote is famous because it's just this is the, the kind of thing that he told with Fredo Lam that that validated with Fredo Lam's Afro-Cuban heritage and really pushed him to explore his own Afro-Cuban identity. Which is, you know, that's wonderful. That's wonderful that Pablo Picasso did that. Now, keep in mind, Pablo Picasso did that because Pablo Picasso understood that, you know, France in particular, other countries from Europe, had spent the last century basically, you know, sexually assaulting politically the whole continent of of Africa, or, you know, I mean that proverbially, just, you know, doing the equivalent of that with all of its resources and culture Um and so, you know, Pablo Picasso at this time, his artwork, he's drawing from some African culture um, 
And I think what I mean by that, he's using like masks to inspire some of his paintings. Like you see here, the woman here, these are five prostitutes in France. Some of them are wearing these African masks because I think Pablo Picasso was trying to rekindle Europe or Western art's sense of magic and or primitive kind of connection to the underlying kind of uh, underlying purpose of art, which is more, I think, at least arguably art at its fullest, most important kind of deepest root is a, a religious, it's a spiritual awakening. Um, it's a kind of intimate emotional journey. And I think if you ask Picasso or Wilfredo Lamb, they would say like, maybe Christianity or colonization sterilized a lot of European art or Western art, domesticated it to the point that now European or Western art struggles for a sense of purpose, like it's lost its soul because it's lost touch with that primitive kind of sub, uh, primary purpose of art, which, you know, I mean, you could say it's community, it's, it's religion, it's spiritual, but it's something that was lost somewhere along the way going from maybe greek roman culture to north africa and egypt somewhere from there to maybe uh the 1800s something was lost to the point that maybe art then served just the rich you know fawning over the rich or becoming part of this art market and as you know as artists you know, sure there's you know value to you can commercialize your art you can get a status from art but in the end it's ultimately just you enjoying it and making it and finding some sense of meaning and purpose and it's such a rich and powerful magic that that very few people kind of know how to operate and use and you can use it for very sinister purposes as we'll see with hitler um hitler very much used art as a way to distinguish between the sort of supremacy of the German people and everyone who is not German, Jews, gypsies, homosexuals, or anyone who we deemed unfit for this sort of high culture of Germany. And it's that kind of attitude towards art that I think, you know, with Fredo Lamb and other artists are kind of reacting to. They embrace abstract art. They start mining more quote unquote primitive cultures for meaningful visual elements. And that's all I think in response to the many centuries of industrialization of Christianity, of uh, modern life as a whole. And so here I'll read this quote for you. It says, Lamb criticized Europeans for turning African and Oceanic works of art into pieces of exotica and sterile museum curiosities and for thereby trafficking in non-Western people's dreams. The dreams that had gone into creating those works of art, dreams that those people had already lost because they had been stolen from them through colonization. When I read that, I think of like the Natural History Museum in New York, you know, a place where you really kind of treat these places with as like exotic um, kind of uh, specimens. And the Natural History Museum is not the same as the MoMA or the Met, right? We kind of we compartmentalized uh, primitive and modern and contemporary. And so this kind of influence from Picasso really, is, you can't overstate the importance because um, it really means Wilfredo Lamb goes from painting artwork, which looks kind of like Picasso or maybe even Matisse. Here, it looks like he's kind of getting some closure for having lost his wife and uh, child during because of tuberculosis. And, you know, that must be such a horrible thing to go to Europe and who you know, maybe, uh, you know, get not get TB, but your wife and child die from it. So, um, you know, I think this is him coming full circle a decade later. And this is the same time Hitler invades Paris, which means with Frederick Lamb is no longer safe, especially being Afro, uh, Afro Cuban or Afro Chinese uh, and his artwork being abstract. You know, Hitler hated abstract artists. Uh, he probably would have thrown people like Picasso in the concentration camps just based on their artwork alone. So Wilfredo Lamb flees Paris, he flees um, you know, Europe and returns to Cuba, which is a big deal. That's a big, you know, coming full circle. And you can see his painting that he makes when he gets back to Vienna. And I can't overstate how how you know exceptional this is. Um, there are very there are few, but not many cases in our history where someone with all of this kind of decades of, of, of momentum has this chance to come back to his home country and kind of make this major statement. And, you know, even just this one painting he does is such a powerful one-off, um, but it's not just a one-off, he does many others, but even just the one painting alone, the jungle that we see behind him is such a unique example of someone 
returning to their home country and making a painting about reclaiming that country for its people, for his people. And of course, when he returned to Havana, you can imagine what he must be thinking like, wow, like has my country changed? Is it better? Is it worse? Um, you know, what's my place in this country? Um, you know, even things like, you know, probably visiting the family of his deceased wife. Um, you know, these are really big personal things. And of course, on top of that, the question of identity and destiny, where's, what's he going to do? And will there be support for him in Cuba? And look at the scale of his artwork here. Pablo Picasso like scale um, behind him with the, the, the painting we're going to see in a mural in a moment, which is a jungle. Now, his comment when he returned to Cuba, this is around 1940, is upon seeing Cuba again for the first time in almost 18 years, Lamb was appalled to find that blacks were living in the same conditions of poverty, discrimination, and exploitation as when he had left, which is a real stinging indictment of the United States' influences in Cuba. It's almost like we've kind of replicated segregation from the South in uh, Cuba to the point where the Secretary of Interior of the United States outlawed the practice of Afro-Cuban religion in Cuba for fear, and get this, for fear that it's going to corrupt the white children or corrupt, uh, yeah, I think it was European children. I think we'll see the quote in a mo moment. So it's just like that paranoia of miscegenation, races blending, uh, you know, different groups having, you know, intercourse with each other. It's such a bizarre paranoia. Um, and it's really a, uh, a a regretful and you know personally painful reality to think that we replicate you know southern uh, Jim Crow basically segregation in Havana or in Cuba um, because of the United States negative influence. So here is the jungle, and you again notice the scale. I could even though it's on an easel, I think you could agree it's almost mural like scale. But what do you think? Does this look anything like? The murals we saw from, like, do you see, this is in the 1943, and we saw the most of the Mexican muralist movement took place in the 1920s and the 1930s. So do you, you see any of the influence from Mexico here on the artwork in by Wilfredo Lamb on the jungle? I would say that it's like, I don't know if I could see like any kind of like, maybe from, maybe from I don't know it's just like very like drastically different I remember looking at this like a few years ago in high school and it was just that's like cool. you looked at this in high school that's cool and it was an art class yeah it was an AP art history class oh, that's um, great. Glad they included so it. I don't know if it's like I could see bits and pieces but it's just so drastically different that I don't really know where I could see that's like similar Good. Yeah, we'll get it back to that point in just a moment. I want to ask, what did, do you remember what you learned about? I know it's a long time ago, not to put you on the spot. Do you remember anything from what your teachers uh, said well, about uh, the specific painting? Mm -hmm. um, I know it was, and I it was the remember. pandemic. It was the pandemic and it was high yeah. school. Don't, I, don't, um, I don't think from high school. <laughs> I think it was, I think that like this painting is like depicting uh, like I think it was like depicting like either like native people or something like that. I'm just blanking. I don't remember, but that's I know no, that's cool. No, I think it's I think it's just so it's just so awesome uh, that you got to see this in high school. It's a uh, really you know the older I get, it's it's hard to understand some paintings until like as an artist, you know, the more your career develops, you develop kind of technique and awareness of how hard some things are, how easy other things are. You know, there's that. Then there's also the older you get, the more you kind of maybe can appreciate the biography of the artist. And of course, also the older you get, kind of you put the whole art world into perspective. So, you know, that's, you know, your relationship to famous works of art will change as you get older in you know, each period is very different. And, you know, this painting, if I, um, you know, I think one thing to really think about is this is a painting by an outsider who hasn't been in Cuba for 20, for what, 20 years, basically, maybe a decade. So such a fascinating example of someone returning to his home country and making a painting, which is really kind of his first reaction to Cuba and, and, and in response to what he saw in Cuba, which we'll get back to in a moment. So one thing to think about with this is sugarcane, the importance of sugarcane in Cuba as a source of oppression and also a major part of African culture, cutting sugarcane and you know, the oppressive heat of Cuba um, 
is a real reality for you know African culture in Cuba. And so I think what he's doing, he's reclaiming the sugarcane fields and showing you this Santeria, an Afro-Cuban performance where the person is possessed by the spirit of the god and they become a horse and there's smoke and music involved. And, you know, if you ever go to Cuba, you should definitely ask to see or be part of a Santeria ritual. This is the kind of thing that would have been prohibited in Cuba at the time because of the United States outlawing any of the religious practices, the Afro-Cuban religious practices. I'm sure that's the same thing that happened in the United States with maybe, uh, unless you maybe sing Christian gospels, I'm sure there are certain Afro-Cuban or, I mean, Afro-African-American Afro, um, culture or African culture, cultural practices that were, you know, secretive because perhaps they were too seen as too threatening to European culture, white culture, Southern culture, whatever may be the case. So here, I think, if anything, what he's doing is he, he's subverting, you know, he's reclaiming the sugar cane and transforming it into you know, like a religious, like almost like a, a cathedral for Afro-Cuban religion, which just, you know, just on that, boom, that's amazing. And the scissors are there kind of very symbolically. And, you know, I know the directly from his own mouth, the quote is the scissors are there to cut ties with that sort of uh, influence, the Creole influence and the influence of Europe. So what's so amazing and remarkable about this picture, he's it is so unlike going back to that first question. It is totally unlike Mexican muralism because he is embracing abstraction. That Picasso, because because remember, you can put Diego Rivera and all the Mexican muralists here on one extreme, and then Pablo Picasso over here at the other extreme. And remember, all of Mexican muralists tried their best to not look like anything from Europe. There was Doctor Adel and the idea of. of creating an artwork that's that looks Mexican, is Mexicana, like Mexicanidad, something innately Mexican. So there is that goal for the Mexican murals to not look at all like anything European, but also to be have resonance with, with Mexicans and maybe indigenous Mexico, uneducated Mexico, abstract art might not be the language for that. Whereas with Fredo Lam, has spent the net last 10 years steeped in the sort of uh, high art of abstraction in a way kind of like Diego Rivera, who you know, was in Europe studying Cubism, but unlike Diego Rivera, with Fredo Lam found a way to use Cubism to comment on the social realities of Cuba. And so even though we might have, and I might have kind of been reiterating the point throughout this class that abstract art might not necessarily be the best language for muralism and or for nationalism and or for addressing history and stuff like that. Um, that's not an absolute truth because here, you know, obviously he's really using abstract art. Now it's not purely abstract. It's, it's There's still some recognizable elements here, but it's a wonderful example of using abstract European art and blending it with African culture, which is a really odd blend, right? Because you would think, you know, Picasso is, you know, that influence is the oppressive European influence, but clearly that relationship between Wilfredo Lamb and Picasso kind of transcended that oppression or something, created a, a little window for some kind of cross-pollination and, and with the benefits of both. Like sometimes you get cross-pollination and you get like, like if you combine like a minivan with like a sports car, just, you know, you get the worst of both maybe, but, you know, or a minivan is like a combination of a truck and a car with like the worst of both, not much room space, not much of a car. But, you know, in this case, you get the best of both, the best of abstraction with this really amazing momentum from Wilfredo Lamb, who is such an authentic voice of reacting to his country as it's changing and changed and providing this super powerful magic from Europe, this abstract art, which is why Wilfredo Lam is one of the reasons why he's such a famous artist and such a, you know, he makes his artwork sells for a lot of money because he is kind of in that legacy of Europe. And so art historians can kind of connect him back to Europe, but also he's an authentic voice, kind of giving voice and restoring African culture to its rightful place, both in the new world and to modern life, and of course in Cuba uh, as, as well. Now, if you want to see the jungle, I believe it's in the MoMA in New York, which is also interesting. He's called this painting a Trojan horse. Um, a, a Trojan horse is the horse that the Greeks brought into Troy, or the Tro Trojans brought into Greek, the Greek horse that they brought into Troy. The Trojans brought it in and it was filled with Greek soldiers and then they left the, the horse in the middle of the night and conquered Troy. Well, the painting here is supposed to be a Trojan proverbial Trojan horse that I guess is meant to explode the sort of art world from within. So it's 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 good on that sense that it's located in the MoMA, 
Um, and Wilfredo Lam is definitely someone in Cuba who's celebrated by the Cuban revolution. But as we'll see, he is not someone who is supportive of the revolution. Wilfredo Lam does not support Fidel Castro at all. We'll see that in a moment. So here you could see these quote here. It says Cuba's secretary. So it, was not, it wasn't the American secretary, but certainly the influence of the United States. The Cuban secretary of the interior had banned all Afro-Cuban religious ceremonies in 1922. Imagine that. Like what a... a what a like petty thing to do um, on the grounds that they were barbaric and that they allegedly led to crimes against children of the white race. So there is a little snapshot of Cuba um, and, of course, the influence, I think, of the United States um, on Cuba. And, you know, really leaves a bad taste in your mouth to read that, doesn't it? And it says when Wilfredo Lam returned to Cuba in 1941, um, Afro-Cuban religions were still largely associated with demon worship and brujeria. Um, and I think that's probably true in the United States, uh, you know, here of like reefer madness, uh, young white women hang out with the young, young black men and, you know, get exposed to the kind of stuff you see here, just kind of ridiculous paranoia about racial mixing. And even here, this is the Menocal family. This woman here is, I think, a descendant of the first artist we saw, the painter, a while ago, earlier in the class. And this, this is her kitchen staff. And I don't think you see much African. I think everyone in Cuba has some African heritage, just like many people in the United States. There's some African uh, blood um, and, you know, we're kind of a mix to a degree. But I think here you really could see the segregation. Um, this is her kitchen staff or her staff at the hotel, which uh, is very segregated. Um, and so that's, you know, just the reality of Cuba. And here you can see a quote from Wilfredo Lamb. Havana at the time was a land of pleasure, of sugary music, rumbas, mambos, and so forth. The Negroes were considered picturesque, a, as, as for mulatto women, they were much sought after and as often as not became prostitutes. When Fidel Castro came to power, there were over 60,000 prostitutes in Havana alone. Um, that might be uh, more of a figurative. I don't know if that's literal. In, in Cuba, you'll often hear people use the term puteria, which means prostitution, and they use that as a way to De denigrate people who are sort of uh, who are con artists. So um, I think with Fredo Lam is kind of using that somewhat hyperbolically, but I don't think that 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 means it's not true. That you know, basically the mindset of Cuba was that of kind of whoring yourself out for tourists. And so when we think about the jungle, the jungle, his painting is very much in response to what he saw when he got back to Cuba, and it's kind of like the equivalent would be if when Diego Rivera returned to Mexico. You know, he missed most of the Mexican Revolution, but imagine he returns to Mexico and the Mexican Revolution was a total failure. The, the, the elites, you know, stayed in power. There was no addressing anything related to indigenous people's rights. And, you know, then he would have made maybe made a painting about the tragedy of the failings of the Mexican Revolution. Well, I think likewise here. Um, in this case, with Fredo Lam returns to Cuba, hoping that there have been changes, but the opposite is true. And so his jungle is a response to what he saw is, is sort of the downward spiral of his home country. And he says, I refuse to paint cha-cha-cha. Cha-cha-cha is the name of the music, uh, style of music popular in the 1950s, 1940s. I wanted to paint the drama of my country, but by thoroughly expressing the Negro spirit, the beauty of the plastic art of the blacks. I knew I was running the risk of not being understood by either the man in the street or by the others, but a true picture has the power to set the imagination to work even if it takes time. And I think that that goes a long way in helping you understand why the jungle is so important. Here are some other pictures of sugar in Cuba, and it really goes to show the importance of sugar. Both, it, it, you see how it almost creates this microcosmos, a self-contained system of oppression where it's like an enclave where all the slaves live on the, on the hacienda, the sugar plantation, and all the infrastructure serves sugar and there are these kind of self-contained bubbles that are like self-contained units of oppression and, and they, they're very isolated. So you can see how this reinforces a kind of country of oppression, especially with sugar being the main source of economic um, growth and prosperity. And other artists from the same time, even the same year, 1943, are addressing similar subject matter. But I don't think any of these examples, although they have their merits, I don't think they achieve the same thing as the jungle um, for different reasons. One of which I think, remember again, with Fredo Lam is left Cuba and returned to Cuba. And he has that 
sort of fish out of water objectivity. But also you could see they're addressing sugarcane in a different way. They're here, they're cutting sugarcane, <clears throat> but it doesn't look like these are African slaves or Africans cutting sugarcane. Um, it's more looking at sugar as almost like a source of nourishment. You know, you can see the person drinking the freshly cut sugar from the sugar cane or just sugar as a matter of fact of Cuban society. Whereas I think the jungle is a much more biting, if not bittersweet, um, restoration of African culture and reclaiming the sugar cane for African uh, religion. This looks a lot like the Mexican muralism we saw. This is by the same artist who did the mural we saw a while ago. This for me has a lot of that energy of Siqueiros and uh, almost feels like a Siqueiros. I don't know why it's almost like airbrush without airbrush, but it looks like it, it definitely is inspired by the Zapata um, Pancho Villa legacy in Mexico. And you're not going to see that from Wilfredo Lamb because he was in Europe. So, you know, remember, he's not someone who was, was in Mexico during uh, the 1930s. He was in uh, Europe. So he was much more influenced by Picasso. Um, but Enriquez was someone who probably was uh, hearing about what's going on in Mexico and wanting to replicate that. But sadly, they don't have that uh, that engine of uh, of political change, which was the Mexican Revolution. So in a way, these are kind of pictures that are marooned by, you know, pictures aspiring for social change and addressing the realities of Cuba, um, but without that sort of central momentum of a, maybe a, a, a resistance movement, you know, an armed struggle, which will change when we talk about Fidel Castro um, in 1959. So remember, when, Fre when Fredo Lam ref returned to Cuba in 1943, this is right before World War II, at a time when the Mexican muralist movement, the, the uh, good neighbor policy is coming to an end. And now we enter the Cold War. And with Fredo Lam is addressing this country, Cuba, which has become a, a country of, of tourism and, and gangsters and hedonism. People go to Cuba for the same reason people go to Cancun or to Las Vegas. I'd say Cuba is a lot like Las Vegas, uh, Cuba in the 1940s, a lot like Las Vegas, only much worse because it's a country without its own sense of sovereignty and with the real kind of, I don't know, maybe schizophrenic sense of self because of the many centuries of dependence on Spain, dependence on the United States and oppression from abroad, from other countries. So, you know, these are other paintings that are similar to the jungle, like this, sugarcane cutters, or this, the Danza, Af and this gets a little closer perhaps to the Wilfredo Lamb, but this one is almost like, almost like more of like the tourist version of the jungle. You know, it has the Afro-Cuban culture in the sugar cane, but here it's like the woman's naked and almost kind of sexualized and the guy's dancing. With it, this feels like the, the, the version of the jungle that's sold to the tourists. You know what I'm saying? So that's what this is. And I'm not, you know, denigrating this painting at all. It's wonderful. But I think there's something, you know, the subtleties that make this so exceptional. You know, this has some sexual elements, you could say, you know, buttocks and body parts, but it's more of like the nude vulnerability, um, whereas this is more like a kind of almost like a sexual dance, like a, like what's the name of the dance? The, um, not the cha-cha-cha, the one dance where bodies are plastered together in the Caribbean. Um, I can't remember the name of that dance. Uh, but yeah, of course, dancing is a big part of Cuba too. You know, salsa, merengue, you know, Latin America period has a lot more dance than the United States. So that is, of course, a part of cultural heritage of Cuba. And here you can see with Fredo Lamb's artwork um, in probably some museum somewhere in the world. And I love his artwork. It's so, I love it because it all looks like you're kind of entering a dream and it's all part of the same dream. And his his artwork continues to evolve and develop, absorb more influence from places like Haiti um, and uh, voodoo and other Afro-Cuban or African culture contributions to the Caribbean. But sadly, as I said before, because of his exposure to people like Hitler and Mussolini in Europe, um, and or just because he's able to maybe see through Fidel Castro's character, he is not a supporter of Fidel Castro. Uh, with Fredo Lam uh, says, thinks that He'll, that Fidel Castro will be like another Mussolini, a strong man and kind of dictator. Um, and with Fredo Lam, in a stinging indictment of the Cuban Revolution, decides not to stay in Cuba. So he does not support 
the Cuban Revolution, except maybe in a few symbolic ways. But I think the biggest way you show support is by, you know, staying in Cuba after the Cuban Revolution. Instead, Wilfredo Lamb returns to Paris. And I think that really goes to show that he felt more comfortable in Paris and or felt like Cuba was not. I mean, think about it. that's a really big uh, big criticism of the Cuban Revolution and Fidel Castro and Che Guevara and all of them that Wilfredo Lamb didn't stay and support them. And, you know, if you think about it, it makes sense. I think you'll understand more as we look at the Cuban Revolution because, you know, someone like Fidel Castro or Che Guevara, they're not people who are like, okay, Cuban Revolution, we're going to, you know, allow gay rights and um, immediately champion the rights of women, partly because we're still in like an era in the 1950s when you know, some of those issues become more, uh, I think, more contemporary, things that happened the last few decades. But also, remember, with Fredo Lamb was in Paris, around the likes of Picasso and others, he's a much more liberal, open, you know, open-minded person, you know, much more, I think, a, a totally different wavelength than someone like uh, Fidel Castro, who, you know, maybe personally he has his own beliefs, but being someone who is kind of leading a revolution, you understand, can understand how his priorities might be a little different than someone like with Fredo Lamb, but that's something we'll talk about on the second half of this class when we address this issue of kind of, well, what will Cuban art look like after the Cuban revolution? Will it be Mexican muralism? Will that be the uh, style of the Cuban revolution? Will it be abstract art? Like will with Fredo Lamb's jungle inspire the next uh, wave of artists? Well, the key question is really, um, what will the artists look like who have been trained by the revolution? Not so much the art that comes directly in the wake of the revolution, which is important and meaningful, and we will look at that. But the more important question is, what about the art by artists who were trained by the revolution, which is to say whose, whose education was funded by the revolution? And, you know, that the equivalent of that would be looking at Mexican artists who were educated by the Mexican Revolution and became famous artists or just and look at the art of artists who were trained by the Mexican or by the education that resulted from the Mexican Revolution. And in a way, Frida Kahlo is a great example of that. She is certainly someone who benefited from the Mexican Revolution and the education. So she is a great kind of barometer of the success of the Mexican Revolution. And I think, you know, from just looking at her artwork, she is a shining example of the uh, accomplishments of the Mexican Revolution. So, um, although not today, next class we'll be looking at the younger generation, people born in, you know, the 19, around 1959, who grew up under the revolution and we'll see, you know, the worthiness of their artwork and as an example of, um, you know, the, the achievements of the revolution in Cuba. But as you might expect, um, abstract art, just like we saw in Mexico, it's a harder pill to swallow for revolutionary governments, uh, partly because it's so kind of depoliticized. It's, there's something about abstract art, which is almost more religious and less political, which is to say it's more personal and more expressive. And if you think about the nature of personal expression versus, you know, the duty to the collective, that it becomes a very interesting question where the boundary between the revolution and non-revolution is. Like we, we hear often in the United States, the personal is political, right? So like during the, the pandemic, you know, some people might use the issue of uh, personal choice and, you know, what you put into your body as a uh, reason for protesting, taking the vaccine and similar to the logic about abortion. And it's just a matter of each person deciding where that line is between kind of your own bodily autonomy and maybe the government's own objectives. And if you look at that as an analogy to artwork, well, you know, should an artist have unlimited freedom to make whatever they want, including bite, biting the hand that feeds them, especially considering that the revolution paid for your artwork. Now think about, you guys are all artists. Imagine, you know, if, if you know, the government paid 100% of your education, including, you know, your housing and your food and how you might have this, you know, unconscious, uh, obligation to not bite the hand that feeds you. So there's that part of it. But then there's this sort of more theoretical question of like, well, you know, is self-expression something that's apart from the revolution? Can you just sort of express yourself? And can you do that in a way that's just separate from, does it need to be revolutionary what you say? Can, can your self-expression be independent from revolution? And or does your self-expression represent a direct challenge to the revolution? Because it isn't under the sort of control, under the sort of 
review of the revolution. And then apart from that, there's also, well, is abstract art clear enough? Is it, is there, does, does it have the clarity of, of representational imagery that um, is so important for um, propaganda purposes? And of course, on that level, abstract art fails because it is so much about personal expression and interpretation. It's certainly not the language of propaganda. So sadly, one of the first casualties of the Cuban revolution is abstract art. And it's partly, and, and even today, I think, and I, I say this without being so critical because I think there's a certain, as we, especially as we look at Robert Rauschenberg is, and his visit to Cuba, there is something out of touch with abstract art when it comes to, you know, think about abstract art, why it didn't really catch on in Mexico. I think for the same reason in Cuba, there's something kind of too ivory tower about it, um, which is, you know, there's exceptions like with Fredo Lamb's jung The Jungle, which we just saw, but it's almost like abstract art isn't the voice of the Mexican revolution and won't be the voice of the Cuban revolution for the same reasons, because it's sort of, they're both state supported art endeavors and abstract art doesn't necessarily justify its existence to the state um, because it's not propagandistic enough. So, you know, this example here is one of the rare instances of kind of very abstract art that you see from uh, the era right before the 1950s. And you certainly won't find much of this after the 1950s because, you know, really because the revolution pervades every part of Cuban culture, you know, from top to bottom. I think now might be a good time to take a break. So let's take a short break, uh, about a 10 minute break. And when we get back, we'll, we'll talk about uh, the Cuban revolution, at least um, kind of the first decades of the Cuban revolution. Any questions from anyone? I'll stop recording. And if you have a question for me, let me know. Um, I didn't give you guys a midterm. Um, actually, let me pause this. I didn't give you guys a midterm. The key question, I think, with the Cuban revolution, kind of like with the Mexican revolution is, you know, how do you make art that is revolutionary? How do you make art uh, and that supports the revolution? Now, in the case of the Mexican revolution, you have a revolution that addresses issues like the marginalized indigenous populations of Mexico, the balance of power between central government and state government, and the balance of power between the rich landowning elites, maybe the merchant middle class in Mexico City and others, and of course, the largely uh, landless rural populations, indigenous people, and the and Mexican Revolution was a reckoning on all those facets of Mexican history. And likewise, the Cuban Revolution is a reckoning on its uh, historical dependence on the United States and or the dominance of the United States over Mexico, I'm sorry, over Cuba, replacing Spain's control over Cuba. So the art of the Cuban Revolution will kind of expect, as you might expect, fluctuate between you know, very propagandistic stuff to stuff that's more, you know, eye level, ground level, grassroots level. And of course, the question will be, does that fall within the revolution or is that outside the revolution? And I don't think these questions came up during the Mexican revolution primarily, and I can't say this is the final word on this, but I think primarily because the Mexican revolution wasn't a communist revolution. And because of that, it wasn't such a centralized revolution. And because of that, you don't have such a kind of top-down approach, which is not to say that there wasn't state support for the Mexican muralism movement, but it's a lot different having a what a democracy, or at least ostensibly a democracy, because democracy is very messy. It often results in whoever has the most money or power becoming the most powerful, and democracy is kind of window dressing sometimes. But that said, at, at least in terms of history, the Mexican Revolution never embraced communism. And because the Cuban Revolution embraced communism, not immediately, it wasn't, Fidel Castro wasn't a communist guerrilla, he was a populist guerrilla, um, G-U-E-R or I-L-L-A, that's a, a kind of a, a, like a, what, that's a soldier, a, a non-official soldier, not a guerrilla like the animal in the jungle. Um, so just guerrilla is a Spanish word for, it's like kind of a soldier. Uh, so Fidel Castro was not communist until after the revolution, but when it became communist, then you have a very centralized state. And I think it's important for you today to really understand the nature of having a powerful central government is a really useful thing, depending on what you want to achieve. 
but of course it comes at a sacrifice. And, and in life you'll find there's no solution to anything. There's always just trade-offs. And that might be the, the job you end up doing or the person you end up dating or where you end up moving, all kinds of, there's never, no, don't ever think in terms of well, what's the right answer. You really just have to measure balance the set of trade-offs, you know, you get something, but you have to always trade something in exchange. And when it comes to communism, the, the benefit you get immediately is you can educate people, you can provide basic health care to people who never had health care, maybe electricity, things like that. And so on that level, it's a real measurable change from what came before, which is landless, poor, impoverished people without any political access to power. But then, of course, the question is, well, what's the trade-off? And, of course, one of the big trade-offs in many communist countries is something like the freedom to travel. And you can understand why if, you're, if you have a centralized state that's paying for your food, your education, and even your housing, that's a big investment over many decades, if not you know, millions of dollars in investment. And that means if you leave the country having received all that investment, then that's just a net drain and then communism might not work unless it's more open or has some kind of compromises within. Because if you're just purely communist, often the case is you don't have the freedom to travel because that might mean people leave the country permanently. And we'll see that is the case in Cuba with artists in the 1980s. And this is very important with the art world because if artists achieve a lot but then leave the country, well, then there's no, no succession. There's no legacy. There's no... Uh, transfer of that artistic momentum to the next generation. And I think you'll see, especially not, not today, but the next class, that will be the case in Cuba with um, diminishing continuity between the generations because so many Cuban artists uh, have left Cuba or possibly will continue to leave Cuba for different reasons, as we'll see today and next class. So before we get too far ahead of ourselves, the Cuban revolution is a you know, as a real uh, challenge to the United States, especially during the Cold War, and especially because Cuba is so close to the United States, and a challenge to the Monroe Doctrine. Remember, the United States doesn't want any European powers interfering in the Western Hemisphere, um, you know, places like Spain and England. Well, now you can include to that the Soviet Union. The United States doesn't want the Soviet Union putting missiles in Cuba that could, you know, launch and hit Miami within a matter of probably seconds, if not minutes. And of course, the reason why the Soviet Union is putting those missiles in Cuba is in response to the United States putting missiles in Turkey. So it's not like the United States is completely innocent in this. Um, and it's not like the Soviet Union isn't just replicating exactly what the United States is doing in Turkey at the time. Um, but very much in terms of our, you know, our understanding of Cuba, this, become, this makes Cuba supremely important to the United States because it is sort of a symbolic political reality where if the United States allows the Cuban revolution to continue without, for instance, sanctions, it sets a message to the rest of Latin America that if you confiscate U.S. land, confiscate private property, um, there won't be any consequences. Now, the question I think will be, Today, is that still relevant? Like, why are, why haven't we ended our sanctions, our embargo on Cuba? Um, is it still relevant? Um, and I think that's a question we'll save for the end. So here we are in 1959. This is the peak. This is kind of like when Zapata and Pancho Villa march into Mexico City. Remember the famous photograph we saw of them sitting down next to each other? And they are very much like the, the model for Che Guevara and Fidel Castro. You know, I think many revolutions are, you know, Leon Trotsky and Joseph Stalin or Vladimir Lenin and Leon Trotsky. It's often the, the byproduct of maybe populism and intellectualism, maybe militant people along with student leaders. So Fidel Castro was like the populist leader who was a, a, a trained lawyer who had been thrown in prison by Batista, who's a dictator in Cuba. And he ends up meeting up with Che Guevara in Mexico. We'll get back to that in a moment. So they're kind of, it's a similar blueprint to what we saw in Mexico with two revolutionaries standing up to a strong man. Um, of course, we in Mexico saw the legacy of Porfirio Diaz. Um, here we're talking about a puppet of the US government, Fulgencio Batista, who had been president of Spain prior, or president of Cuba prior to this term in 1950s. And, he did better things during his previous term 
but that's being very generous to him because he pilfered the public coffers and was, I think, just another example of a person who had more personal interest um, in making money and that came at the expense of the average Cuban. And this is the kind of oppression and dictatorship allied closely with the gangsters and the mafia in Cuba that Fidel Castro fought violently against and overthrew, primarily in the eastern part of Cuba. And um, as we'll see, some of the protests today in Cuba are in the eastern part of Cuba because that's so far from the center of power in Havana. So going back to Wilfredo Lamb, here you can see a quote from a friend about what Wilfredo Lamb told him that basically uh, Frank or that Fidel Castro will be like another Batista or worse than Batista or be like another Franco in Spain. So Wilfredo Lamb moves back to Paris. He's not impressed by Fidel Castro, but I think you can understand that Wilfredo Lamb is not the kind of person the revolution is necessarily intended for in the, in the sense that so many Cubans are don't have have not don't leave Cuba. They don't they aren't talented artists. They're poor landless peasants who've never gotten an education, don't have access to running water, basic medicine and electricity. So the value of the Cuban revolution really has to be measured from the point of view of the person, you know, characterizing it, evaluating it. If you're a middle class person, you might not be you might not like Fidel Castro. But if you're a poor Guajiro, a poor campesino, especially maybe if you're a, pure, a, a poor person of African descent, Fidel Castro might represent a big positive change for your life. So one example of art from this period after the revolution, and remember, it has a, a certainly has a period of, you know, the violent conflict. And during the violent conflict, you're not going to see a lot of artwork. But I think by the, by the, by the end of the violent ar ar conflict, you would expect to see, you'd want to know, well, what 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 is the Cuban government's attitude towards art? What is the revolution's attitude toward art? And right out of the gate, you'll see what you will come to see as the sort of the rule, not the exception in Cuba, which is everything is very politicized. Everything is very extreme in Cuba. Um, whether it's you know thinking of Cuba as a paradise or as a sort of dystopia, uh, some people see. And, and if you talk about Cuba, most people have either a very pro-revolutionary attitude or very anti-revolutionary. And it's very hard to find a kind of middle ground. And, you know, I'm going to do my best and I've done my best to find that middle ground. But that's kind of my goal. But many of you probably, if you're many people of Cuban heritage, will be often very critical of the Cuban revolution for right, very good reasons. And many people... Uh, for other reasons, maybe for more left-leaning, Cuba represents a real positive step for um, you know revolution and social change. And Cuba has achieved a lot of things that are really worthy of our interests. Things like environmental changes because of this collapse of the Soviet Union in the 1990s, um, and of course uh, advancing you know Afro-Cuban culture. Um, but of course, that on the other extreme. Cuban government doesn't allow religion because you know communist is kind of communism is kind of the state religion. So you know for me it's a big strike against the revolution that you know people can't practice Afro-Cuban religion in revolutionary Cuban society because it's a religion and that's against communism and that's the kind of thing that probably turned off Wilfredo Lamb. Now that said, Wilfredo Lamb does kind of symbolically contribute to this uh, very important mural here, which is kind of a reference to the group of people who had been exiled by Hitler in the 1950s um, in, out of Paris. So this is a kind of reference back to that kind of intellectual group of resistance against Hitler, uh, the title, the Salon de Mayo, um, and also a really kind of what you'd expect, a, an outpouring of artistic support for the Cuban revolution during this honeymoon period, you know, honeymoon period after you get married is that period and maybe honeymoon after you when you start dating someone is that period of months when you're smitten and in love and everything is copacetic and good. And that's that the honeymoon period, there should be no fighting every that's when you deepen those lasting love and all that. And it's and it's after the honeymoon when you start noticing maybe differences and and maybe incompatibilities. Well, this is the honeymoon period for the Cuban revolution when the whole world is supportive, especially people on the left and the art world tends to be uh, more on the left. And that's understandable when you think about there's a kind of overlap between 
art and creativity and openness. And I'm not saying that there isn't value to being, you know, there's a value to the people who are more on the closed conservative side in the sense that they're kind of like, these are the principles that are inviolable. This is the bedrock, the foundation, where people who are open are always exploring and wanting to push the envelope and explore new things. And so there's a kind of unspoken alliance between the left wing and the art world because of the openness, the emphasis on wanting diversity and openness and change and progress. And you can see how that is a very different kind of wavelength than the wavelength, which is more cautious and kind of doesn't want diversity and wants things to remain stable. And those are kind of a mirror, that's a mirror image of kind of the attitudes towards Cuba. And of course, imp more importantly than that is there are politically opportunistic people who will take advantage of the emotion and all the politics to serve their own personal ends. And that of course is just the reality of human nature. And so we will kind of see that play out as we move forward. This is I think, a kind of fitting, um, perhaps uh, fittingly in the following the footsteps of the Mexican muralist movement in the sense of using art to kind of crystallize the Cuban revolution. This definitely looks like a kind of statement about community and artists supporting Cuba. Um, you know, it's not necessarily a, something by one artist. So I think it's more about a collective show of support for Cuba, especially in the face of the United States kind of probably doing everything it can just to um, stop communism from spreading from Cuba to elsewhere. And I think this is a great example of artists kind of erring on the side of idealism and not necessarily considering um, some of the more real concerns when it comes to, you know, making revolutionary art. Like, where's the boundary of self-expression? Do you have to be political? Does art, is, art, is this propaganda or is it not? And we'll see today that Propaganda becomes a, a sort of first wave of uh, visual art in Cuba in the form of the posters that we'll see. And we can't talk about that without, of course, talking about Che Guevara, who is someone who comes straight out of like Hollywood central casting. Uh, he looks like like Hugh Jackman's Wolverine with cigar smoking, like he's almost more like cooler than Wolverine from, that's how he reminds me of here. And there's a charisma to Che Guevara and the charisma, not just in his appearance, but also he's from Argentina. So he's a kind of, he's a fish out of water. And so his his commitment to revolution transcends his, his, his obligation to his home country. And I think that makes him really attractive and appealing because he's someone whose commitments to principles, you know, make him, kind of someone who is like a, an errant knight, like a Lancelot, someone who can contribute his principled uh, you know, vigor to the cause of revolution, which is what he does. And his transformation really is almost a result of witnessing, is a result of firsthand witness, uh, him having firsthand witnessing, uh, handedly witnessing, witnessed the United States uh, involvement in Latin America during the Cold War. And as anything, if anything, it's a very ugly period of American history, kind of almost a repeat of that imperialist era of the early 1900s that led to the Mexican Revolution. And here you could see his transformation. He was a medical student. He suffered from asthma. And his idealism, I think, really guides him to um, you know, eventually embrace revolution. And I think it's his exposure to the violence of US involvement in places like Guatemala, where the United States sends in the CIA to overthrow a democratically elected president, Jacobo Arbenz. Um, and Che Guevara witnesses, witnesses that in Guatemala, you know, he travels all over Latin America, eventually uh, comes to Guatemala. And this is a sort of a freewheeling trip around Latin America on a motorcycle. And you know, a really cool thing to you know, maybe that resonates with you guys being about the same age in college. He leaves college and goes on a road trip. And eventually, after witnessing the United States horrible efforts to topple the government in Guatemala, um, he allies with Fidel Castro. And by this point, Che Guevara is very much a revolutionary, very much against the United States, and is sort of like a crew looking for a boat. And the boat will be uh, the Cuban Revolution, specifically the Granma, the boat that Fidel Castro takes with Fidel, with Che Guevara and other revolutionaries from Cuba to go back to Cuba and invade and start the Cuban Revolution, which is what they do. So here they are in Mexico City meeting. Fidel Castro was a trained lawyer. Um, che Guevara was a doctor. 
They look nothing like the revolutionaries that we have come to know. Um, and yet they both will kind of become of age and mature into revolutionaries. Um, here you could see a picture of Jacobo Artabans. Yes, yeah, it's really ugly that the United States, you know, the head of the CIA, the the this the the man uh, Dulles, his brother was the head of the fruit company. So you got this really ugly nepotism between these two super powerful brothers, very similar to the Bush family. Uh, the Bush senior was the head of the CIA. You know, equally kind of entrenched power. Um, you know, with with a lot of political power and economic power combined. And so it's because of that that sinister influence of the powerful fruit company, um, they convinced Eisenhower and the CIA to send in the CIA to take over, topple the government. And this is all just to serve the United States economic interests. And of course, we use the, the Cold War as justification. So this goes back to that point I was making about political opportunism. Even though there is this kind of Cold War between capitalism and communism, like many things, it will ultimately come down to people who have money and want to preserve their power and not necessarily about principle or commitment to capitalism or communism. And Fidel Castro and Che Guevara are very much following the footsteps of Jose Marti um, invading Cuba to topple Spain. Of course, in that case, Marti was, was, set, was killed, becomes sort of a martyr of the Cuban cause for independence. And to add insult to agony, the United States takes over the Cuban independence. Basically, Cuba had been running the marathon of its independence from Spain for decades. And at the very last 10 feet, the United States invades with Fidel, I mean, not Fidel, Teddy Roosevelt and the Rough Riders. And we cross the finish line and declare Cuba independent. So really tacky, um, maybe not as bad as sending the CIA into Cuba, I mean, into Guatemala, but certainly really bad for Cuba because Cuba becomes a protectorate of the United States as we've seen for the next few decades. So Fidel Castro is very much following this tradition, if not fulfilling the dream of Jose Marti. And had Fidel Castro not committed to communism and or had he op held open and fair elections, things might have turned out very differently. Um, and then maybe not even necessarily for the better, um, but certainly differently. So, you know, this is where we kind of break from that legacy of Jose Marti and where we really kind of now get out of that loop that we were talking about the early part of the 20th century. And we kind of fully move forward into the Cold War and into a world really defined by um, kind of politics and well, what else with well, a specter of nuclear annihilation, which can't be, you know, you cannot downplay the fear of, you know, annihilation, world annihilation, because of the awesome power of the atom bomb. So here's Fidel Castro and his little brother, Raul. And they're both, this is the moment of triumph. So another kind of throwback to, you know, Zapata and Pancho Villa at the moment of triumph. The big difference is, if you remember, Emiliano Zapata and Pancho Villa, they both refused power. They didn't want to become president. And you know, maybe if they had become dictator for life, maybe they would have accepted the job. But in Mexico, it seems like the one rule is if you ever become president, you're going to be assassinated. So it's probably a wise move to not become the leaders of uh, Mex of Cuba, uh, of Mexico. But of Cuba, Fidel Castro and Raul, they become, you know, eventually dictators. Both of them will be dictators at some point. And you can almost feel the... Uh, I don't think there's, I don't think Raul Castro threw his hand, fist in the air as a reference back to Orozco, but you know, we've seen that raised fist before. Um, and so it's, it is an interesting throwback to the Orozco, the raised fist, um, of course, in this moment, it's just a moment of think of, of jubilant, jubilance and joy and triumph. Um, but we'll see how that kind of plays into Cuba's uh, outward expression of solidarity with other uh, resistance movements around the world, um, trying to emulate what happened in Cuba. And of course, this goes back to Che Guevara because Che Guevara will be the major symbol of exporting the Cuban revolution to other countries, particularly um, because he eventually is killed and becomes a sort of martyr, a Jesus Christ-like figure of kind of sacrificing for your ideals, but also because he's someone who wants to keep fighting the revolution and exporting the revolution, whereas Fidel Castro his role is to kind of deepen the Cuban revolution and crystallize it and cement it into permanence. And so you can see a almost like Vladimir Lenin versus uh, uh, Trotsky or Stalin versus Trotsky. Lenin or 
or Fidel Castro would be the equivalent of Stalin, whereas Trotsky would be the equivalent of Che Guevara, this sort of guerrilla revolutionary versus the bureaucratic revolutionary. And Che Guevara understands that in the Cold War, there are all these places around the world that are susceptible to communism, particularly in Asia and Africa. These are all the remnants of the British Empire. You can see it shrinking into what you see here with the only remaining parts that are under British rule in the Western Hemisphere, the Bahamas, uh, that looks like Belize, the Guyana, um, some of the Antilles, and I'm not sure where else um, is worth mentioning here, um, but you could see the British Empire is in steep decline after World War II, and the remainders, the remains of its possessions in, you know, in India, Southeast Asia, and Africa will become the sort of uh, the the source of a place of a feeding frenzy for capitalism and communists to exert our influence and mainly to to take control of the destiny of those countries for politically symbolic reasons, but also economic reasons. And importantly, the specter of nuclear annihilation will kind of feed into the paranoia in this period. Now, this I show you this this map here um, and point out that the the GDP, the gross domestic product of all of the Soviet Union, was equivalent to I think probably California. Um, I don't know if it's California today or back then. But the point is just to show you that you really didn't have an economic threat from the Soviet Union the way they kind of made it out to be. So there's a lot of political opportunism in this period. But I think it's understandable also to remember remember that it only takes one nuclear weapon to really disrupt the entire world. And you know, I don't know if you know, but you know, nuclear when a nuclear weapon explodes. Uh, and by the way, I think there's a cartoon face on this blast here. We'll just I left that there because it kind of neutralizes the scariness of a nuclear bomb. But when a nuclear bomb detonates, it ionizes, it strips the electrons and the protons off the molecules, rendering them radioactive. And the fallout, which is the dust cloud, is all radioactive. And so we're talking like decades, if not centuries of radiation that will have birth defects and cause cancer for people. And will really, you know, really have a huge impact on human populations, especially if you have a global you know, all out nuclear war, that means everyone in the world will probably plunge into the equivalent of the Stone Age, not medieval, like Stone Age, like back uh, thousands of years. And, you know, that means probably the end of electricity, the end of science. And so nuclear war, you can't downplay the dangers of nuclear war. Um, and certainly today, we are, you know, at war with Russia, and so things could very quickly escalate depending on what happens, and hopefully they won't. Um, but of course, nuclear weapons, you could also say, are a deterrent or something that has prevented us from entering World War III. So again, the Cold War is a time of great contradictions with extremes, and something which is totally destructive is also something that up to today has prevented another World War III. So it's a very tricky era to have a sort of, it's hard to have a one, it's hard to, um, you know, totally side with, you know, take sides or to even make sense of it because it's so convoluted. And I think it's just the sort of world hemorrhaging in response to the world modernizing and coming to terms with, you know, the, the nature of global power and trade and the limits of, you know, not wanting to go to war because the dangers of an industrialized war and the dangers of, you know, being able to do more damage than ever. And of course, the the, the social movements within countries like the women's rights movement, uh, you know, civil rights movement, the countercultural movement, transformations, youth culture, all these things are taking place alongside these kind of global changes. So going back to Cuba, we have the United States really with this now with this uh, gadfly, Cuba is a gadfly or a, a real annoyance to uh, the United States, especially in this sort of realm of political symbolism. So we, instead of invading Cuba, now the United States is on the world stage. We can't really resort to our tactics from before, from bygone eras. And because mainly because of the Cold War, if we invade Cuba with our military, the rest of the world will look at that and say, hey, wait, I thought you were this the, you know, country that represents freedom and you're not the oppressors, you're not the fascists, you're not the totalitarians. So what's the solution? Well, instead of sending our military in, we use the CIA to train Cuban exiles how to fight and they invade Cuba 
um, to topple Fidel Castro and Che Guevara and the newly established communist revolution. And the idea would be once these, once these Cuban exiles set foot on Cuba, they can declare a, a, a kind of a, a provisional government and then the United States can ally with that government and then we can send the military in. And it's sort of like, you know, like gaslighting or like this sort of, it's, it's, it's political symbolism without political principle, you know what I mean? So, you know, and, but that's not to say that Kennedy isn't, Kennedy knows that we don't live in an era where the United States can just push countries around. We're now, we now have the United Nations. We now have a world where we're trying to represent a different side of, of freedom than what the Soviet Union represents. And not coincidentally, this is the same time period when Kennedy changes US foreign policy or U US immigration policy. This continues under LBJ. And so I think Kennedy's kind of like a Barack Obama, a young leader who represents promise and change and all the things you would expect from a fresh face, a fresh young mind with all the sort of vitality of a young leader. And I don't think that's, you know, I think that's probably goes a long way explaining why he's assassinated. He is a figure that represents change. He changes U.S. foreign uh, immigration policy to what we have today, where we're inviting people more from all around the world to come to the United States, which is another policy change that really is intended to make the United States much more in stride with the principles of freedom and democracy. So you could really see how the political calibration of the United States has changed from during World War II and from the good neighbor policy to the Cold War, where we'd have this existential threat from the Soviet Union, but we also have the, the sort of world is watching us. And, you know, that continues today where, you know, if, if we do really bad things in Iraq or in Afghanistan or in where in, um, you know, in Ukraine, you know, China will immediately you know tell the world, look, the United States claimed to be the leader of the world. And yet look at these horrible things it's doing. And that's really, you know, that's important politically, di diplomatically. And, you know, that's 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 true. If we're only if we have principles only in word, but not in deed, you know, the rest of the world is watching. So this is the nature of this era, the kind of uh, the Kennedy era where he's walking on eggshells, trying to, um, you know, fight that Cold War, but to not win the war and lose the peace because of the rest of the world, you know, we alienate the rest of the world by being too um, either belligerent or too bullish. So here's Kennedy walking next to Eisenhower after the failed Bay of Pig invasion. Fidel Castro crushes that invasion. And here the United States is doing some very serious soul searching. And in the end, we end up making a deal with Khrushchev. Um, basically the deal is if the Soviet Union doesn't put missiles, nuclear weapons in Cuba, you know, 90 miles from Havana, from Miami, if we don't, if they don't put missiles in Cuba, then the United States will agree not to invade Cuba. So that's a big arrangement, right? United States says we won't get involved with Cuba, we'll leave it alone, but no nuclear, no nuclear weapons in Cuba. And that, you know, that's, that's, uh, that is a, a piece that is a, you know, a, a conclusion to the Cuban Missile Crisis. The only problem for Fidel Castro is he was excluded from this, you know, this meeting. So in a way, Fidel Castro is kind of seen as a sort of, you know, not as politically relevant. And so in response to this, Fidel Castro really pushes to support Che Guevara and promote the spread of revolution around the world, because I think Fidel Castro feels a little bit excluded by this meeting between Fidel, I mean, between Khrushchev and Kennedy. And Fidel Castro claims the torch of being the leader of, quote, the non-aligned movement, countries like North Korea, Iran, and other countries that don't fully support the Soviet Union or fully support the um, United States, which is why they're called the non-aligned movement. And that puts Cuba in a very interesting spot. And I will say Cuba does, and Fidel Castro does achieve some really important things, especially in their fight against apartheid South, South Africa, which we're going to look at now. So when it comes to this era after the Cuban Missile Crisis, it's really a, this is the moment where Cuba starts exporting revolution um, to other countries with some support from the Soviet Union as far as economic support in Cuba, but in a way this this exporting the revolution comes as a kind of annoyance to the Soviet Union. And I think some people think that even Che Guevara became a real pain in the butt for uh, the Soviet Union. We'll get back to that in a moment. But first let's take a look 
at the Soviet revolution, because this is an important blueprint for what happens with Cuba, just like with the Mexican revolution. Now, remember, the Soviet Union revolution happened in the 1917. And I won't spend too much time here just to point out we have another mirror image of what we've seen so far with artists kind of with artists given this 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 mandate to make art that addresses the revolutionary spirit. And, you know, as you expect from Russia, a very different approach to it, we're from Soviet Russia, which is Imperial Russia, um, communist Imperial Russia, you have this return to zero, like almost like a, like a very engineering, like approach to art that goes back to the very starting point of like black and white squares. And it's, yeah, I love that, the idea of, you know, the arts are trying to keep pace with the revolution by making artwork that goes back to square one, just like communism is sort of rebuilding from, from zero. That's what the artists seem to be doing here, which is great. I think that's awesome. You know, that's a really clear and uh, it's a great way to show, make abstract art meaningful in terms of the political value of a square. You know, it's not just abstract, it's a political square, which represents rebuilding from, you know, like this black void or from the basic building blocks of color. Sadly, as you will expect from many revolutions, that honeymoon period of the arts and the politics being totally married and harmonious goes to becomes estrangement. And instead of embracing the abstract art, the com the communist revolutionary government of Russia, the Soviet Union, will embrace Soviet um, social realism. So instead of this period of innovation and experimentation, um, uh, we get to social realism. And this is the time when Trotsky is expelled from the Soviet Union. If you remember, he seeks refuge in Mexico with the Diego Rivera family. And we all remember um, the toxic, incestuous uh, nightmare that was the Rivera Kahlo household when Trotsky was staying with them. So it's funny that it really brings us back to Mexico for a moment. Um, but going back to the Soviet Union, social realism becomes the main imagery of communism. And, you know, if you've ever seen social realism, you know, some of it's beautiful, you know, maybe Norman Rockwell-like quality, uh, maybe some photorealist elements to it. But I think the big criticism of it, and I'm sure you guys would agree, is it's really top-down art, or art that's more propagandistic. And, you know, imagine if you're a painter, someone painting Joe Biden or B Donald Trump. You now, there's nothing wrong with doing that. But if that's sort of all you do, and if it's the government telling you that's what you should do, then it feels like you can understand how art that's propagandistic is so different than art that's free from the state control or state supervision. And so you have this wave of artists painting stuff like that, fawning all over Joseph Stalin, fawning all over Vladimir Lenin. I mean, the message here is Lenin's hard at work, pious. He doesn't have a, a lot of luxury. You know, hard at work writing probably on behalf of the communist revolution. And this is, you know, pure propaganda um, and, you know, with a lot of artistry supporting it, but ultimately kind of a very propagandistic message. And you might expect, well, then this is exactly what you will, we will see from Cuba, social realism. But in fact, this is not what we see because within the Soviet Union, you see this uh, transformation into a more open culture, a more openness towards the arts by the time of Khrushchev, which is in the 1950s. So in a way, Q Q communist revolution in, in Soviet Union has come full circle, or at least it's it's come a long way to the point where it understands that you need more openness, that there's no reason to be so big brother about or so controlling over the art scene. And as a result, the Cuban revolution, which comes to being, is born in the 1950s, it will benefit from having, from its dependency on the Soviet Union, both economic dependency, it exchanges sugar for oil, but also the arts benefit because there's a greater openness for the Soviet Union, which translates to the Cuban government modeling its own approach to the arts off of its economic lifeline, the Soviet Union. So art in Cuba at the time of the revolution will in fact be a little less social realist, um, a little less at least kind of propagandistic in that more traditional sense. Um, and so let's take a look at it. And here you can see the first examples will be from the world of film. And I think you can appreciate there's a certain kind of Cuba quality to the artwork you see here. And you might, you know, here's a chance for you to think about, you know, parallels with the Mexican revolution. I think immediately the first thing I notice is the bright colors, the bright tropical colors that you see here. 
Um, I'm going to speed up a little bit just so we get a little further ahead. Um, we'll take about, about another five or 10 minutes. I just want you to appreciate the Cuba contribution to art in terms of color and sort of the zest, this really wonderful kind of feeling of simplifying imagery and freedom, starting with the film scene and then eventually spreading into um, posters that support um, civic society, you know, harvesting tobacco, harvesting sugarcane, recycling, using less power. And all this is using the arts to support the revolution and you know, doing so here in more of a kind of public service way, not necessarily um, you know, stoking the flames of revolution, but it's a really refreshing departure from this stuff. I'm really glad that you don't see pictures in Cuba of you know, Fidel Castro and Che Guevara standing, you know, supervising, overlooking Havana. You will see pictures of them. Um, and if anything, maybe closer to this, but even not quite like this, um, you know, this is more, this looks, uh, what, North Korea? Um, you know, this I like a little more because at least it's celebrating work, celebrating hard work. Um, but this is more what you'll get from Cuba. Um, Fidel Che Guevara is killed in Bolivia in 1960s and becomes a martyr. And exporting revolution becomes kind of using Che Guevara as a symbol of revolution. You can almost feel the message here is to spread the revolution throughout Latin America. Um, and this, again, is really the kind of this is this characterizes Cuba in the 1970s, um, especially after the death of Che Guevara, that romantic leader figure of sacrifice becomes a symbol of spreading the revolution around Latin America. And I think you can see that here. And in all these example of poster art, I mean, most of these posters have either Jose Marti or Che Guevara. And you can see it showing support to countries around Africa and Asia. And those are really where the countries most susceptible to communism are located. So these posters here really show you this support against the United States in Southeast Asia, the Vietnam War, for instance, here. Uh, this is a young woman. She grew up to become a you know, very happy older lady. But this is a very painful picture for people to look at in the United States during the Vietnam War. And Che Guevara's whole goal was to have these kinds of pictures become the norm and the world to reject the United States, um, similar to kind of leaving Afghanistan here, the United States is departing Vietnam. And this is a very sad moment of failure by the United States in the Cold War. And Che Guevara and Fidel Castro are very much supporting this non-aligned movement against the United States and you know, even kind of independently of the Soviet Union. And I think the best example of this, and it culminates and or the greatest contribution to the world by Cuba during this period is in its fight against apartheid Africa. Um, I think we'll end on that when you see that here. Che, you know, the problem for Che Guevara is if he goes to Africa, he's going to stick out like a sore thumb. He'll be easily identified as Che Guevara. So that's why he ends up going to Bolivia, because he'll blend in there. And that, you know, is a challenge of fighting revolution abroad is, you know, you have to infiltrate, you have to be clandestine. And so that's why he doesn't stay in Africa. But the efforts in Africa do continue because Cuba has such a huge African population that the African soldiers, Cuba, the Cubans of African descent in the Cuban army can blend in in places like Angola, and they become a major pain in the ass to apartheid South Africa. And, you know, I'm very proud for uh, growing up of remembering the, the end of South Africa as apartheid, you know, the segregation is, you know, like segregation in the southern part of the United States, but, you know, to another degree, another order of magnitude. Um, and of course, it continues onward into the 1980s. So Cuba plays a really important role as a third party negotiating a peace between Angola and South Africa. South Africa has sort of had its imperialist ambitions on the rest of Africa to continue the status quo of the this apartheid, the separation of whites from blacks. And of course, it's even worse in Africa because that, of course, is, you know, people of African descent have a rightful sense of belonging and, you know, presence in Africa. And so Cuba contributes to contributes a lot of soldiers, thousands of soldiers in the fight against South Africa. And eventually there is a peace 
uh, settlement. And the peace deal is basically South Africa agrees to leave Angola in exchange, Cuba agrees to leave Angola too. So without Cuba having been involved, there probably wouldn't have been a way for South Africa to save face. So I think when people really record the legacy of Fidel Castro, if I were doing it, I would say that's one of the achievements of him. Um, you know, I think people in Africa probably still celebrate South, uh, Cuba because of their assistance in helping Angola keep South Africa and their super racist policies. I mean, for instance, in, in Africa, South Africa, you know, it's very typical that one family would have like 30, 30 different you know, equivalent of slave labor working for them. And just think about how that ruins everyone, you know, both the, the people doing the work and also it sort of just makes people who are, you know, using that labor into just sort of monsters. And so South Africa becomes a very a monstrous part of the Cold War that Cuba plays a big role in thwarting. And so I think that's the real kind of triumph of Fidel Castro in this era of exporting revolution using propagandistic posters, right? So now, when we get back next week, we will talk about um, kind of the, the achievements of the revolution into the 1980s, um, but also the influence of art from the United States on Cuba, the likes of Andy Warhol, the likes of who is kind of translated into work by Raul Martinez in the 1960s. And we'll look at the likes of Robert Rauschenberg and his impact on art in Cuba. And it really raises this important question of, for especially for Cuban artists, is do you want to maintain relevancy? Do you want to be relevant on a world artistic stage? Or do you want to make art that looks that that originates in Cuba that looks distinctly Cuban, which is to say it bears no resemblance to art from the United States? which, you know, is an important avoidance because you don't want to look like the capitalist imperialist um, overlords. So the question I think will become really important when we look at the next wave of artists, the first art wave of artists in Cuba trained by the revolution, educated by the revolution is what will they do in the aftermath of the 1960s? You know, will they, um, you know, what will it, the artwork look like? Will, will it be propagandistic um, social realism? Will it be like poster art? And what is the boundary? Um, where does the revolution stop? And where does your own personal kind of creativity begin? And all this, of course, will be, uh, these are questions, important questions to ask as Cuba continues to deal with its own internal questions, questions like, you know, like other countries are dealing with the same time, women's liberation, gay rights, and of course, with a state controlled government, a very centralized government, you know, the ability to do things um, to violate human rights is that much greater than a country with more checks and balances. So we'll see how that, all that plays out when we look at Cuba um, next week in the 1970s, but particularly 1980s, 1990s, and into the present day. And we'll look at artists like Antonia Itis and how her work, um, she becomes very much marginalized. Sadly, this painting causes a lot of problems for her because you know just the idea of having a podium for, for someone to speak and address the audience as if you were Fidel Castro um, uh, earns her some criticism, which kind of forcibly and early puts her into a retirement and is a real sad um, indictment of the Cuban revolution in the 1970s. Um, but that said, I think what you'll see in the 1980s and 90s is really interesting because all those artists are artists who were trained by the revolution and who will really have to kind of respond to this question of what art what will their artwork look like that will it look cuban will it look american will it look mexican will will it be something totally unique and um you know how will it navigate these questions of like the boundary between being political being apolitical and of course being relevant to cuban society at large and yeah i think that's a good place to end and so next week we will pick up with antonia itis and more importantly i'm this is all building up to an artist who will look at um who's working today in Havana. And I don't think he even realizes how important his artwork is from our point of view, because I think he is a really, you know, he, he as an individual is really continuing this legacy of revolutionary art. Um, and it really is such a wonderful thing to see because every day he's making new art. And, you know, you know, today he's probably out somewhere in Havana making art. And I think it's really, really wonderful work. And I think, Many years from now, you'll look back and say, wow, that that artist is now famous. And we've heard about him in this, you know, class about 
Cuban art. So I think it'll be someone who you'll find is probably the closest equivalent to Banksy um, that you'll find in Cuba. And of course, that question of being a Banksy in Cuba is so important because, you know, Banksy is a institutional challenge, a, a critique of the art world. Um, but I wouldn't say Banksy is necessarily a political challenge, but in Cuba, a Banksy would be a political challenge because by definition, a Banksy would be outside of the art world, someone who's not trained by the revolution, someone who's apart from the institution and being outside of the revolution or outside of the institution in Cuba is a big no-no. So next week, we'll kind of put the whole goal will be to put his what he's doing into context, this kind of Cuban Banksy into context with how he relates to or compared to the work by other artists who are within the revolution, who are trained by the revolution, educated by the revolution, and eventually have the freedom to travel to and from Cuba um, because they become almost like the equivalent of like a Che Guevara figure exporting revolution or, or almost uh, clandestinely supporting the revolution because they are the benefit benefactors. They are the privileged status of artists who really benefit from the revolution and are perfect ambassadors for the revolution, especially in an age when the revolution is crumbling. Of course, that also means artists become almost a privileged elite. And I think that will be a question for them moving forward is that privileged status may, might might kind of eviscerate that authenticity that is so important for being a sort of meaningful, important artist in the contemporary world. So that's a good place to end. I'm gonna stop recording and let me know if you have any questions about um, anything related to, you know, I think if mainly with your paper, just.